you know me anytime you want to come talk to me so just uh, let me know what, what, what's on your mind so we uh, started last meeting with uh, kind of I, I explained it we're going to be at a we were at a 50,000 foot view and we were basically just getting providing information well we're dropping down to about 30,000 feet tonight but we're still providing a lot of information at the end we will have some question and answer time but it's mainly going to be just information we're kind of letting you know the, the process of where we have what we've gone through so far up to this point and where we are. Um, I really don't have a whole lot to say tonight. I'm going to let Mr. Gadbois, this is Robert Gadbois. He's with Owner Builders Resource. It's a he has civil engineering firm that basically does, you know, um, consulting work for school districts to kind of help them with facilities and planning and looking at the available spaces that we have. We have done a lot of walking and touring of our campuses and, and mapping out our square footage and our, our buildings and looking at classroom sizes. And he'll go through all of that tonight and kind of show you what the process is, what we've been doing. Okay. So this time, I'll turn it over to Robert Gabbard. All right. Thank you, Mr. G. Uh, we are we are an educational facility planning uh, program management firm, but facility planning is really a big big part of what we do. And so over the next three hours, you're probably going to learn more about I'm kidding. It's not going to take that long. <laughs> oh, I forgot to tell you, he's got a lot of jokes. Well, <laughs> you know, everything we're dealing with, is it's important. It's about your kids. It's about your community. And sometimes we can get all balled up and, and focus on some micros, and we lose sight of the big picture. And if we can't have fun with it, if we're not focused on the kids and, and their learning environment, then I think we're, we're kind of spinning our wheels. So I do like to have fun with it. But uh, this is an open presentation. If you guys have a question while I'm going through these things, raise your hand, holler at me, and I'll do my best to, to answer them. But I want to take you through our process of uh, analyzing your schools with respect to capacity and utilization and how we might put you guys in a posture to deal with some challenges that you might be facing uh, in the near or long-term future. We started with, a, with an overall look of your enrollment throughout the years, and as most of you probably know if you've been here a while, Kennedale's sort of been on a bit of a decline, but for those of you that are on staff that are in the trenches, you know that there have been bubbles through the system where you've got maybe more kids in third grade or a bubble in fifth grade or something that's, that's affecting the, the capacity of your various schools to serve the student enrollment. And so it's important for us to understand what you've experienced. I know we come into districts sometimes where, where they'll say, you know what, we used to have 800 kids in that school. What happened? Now we're at 590 and you're telling us we're out of space. So I'll talk about that in, in just a minute. But we did want to do an overall assessment or evaluation of your historical enrollment. And that's what we came, that, this is what this illustrates. Uh, recently, and I believe it's posted on your website, uh, UT Arlington <clears throat> did a demographic study for your district, and that information is, is out there for you guys to review to sort of give you a snapshot of what the near-term future looks like for the potential of student growth in Kennedale. What we do as part of our effort is to break down your campuses, and we literally go room by room. And we do several things. We, we benchmark those spaces to what the administrative code says it should be, and I'll explain that in just a moment. We identify what all the spaces are being used for, and we try to determine what the utilization of that campus actually is. And I can say this with all the love in my heart because I've got two daughters that are teachers. Any elementary principals in here? Ah. Okay, you give an elementary principal five extra rooms and she's gonna figure out a way to use those for something. And so they'll say, we're out of space. But we can look at the magic of how that building lives and breathes during the day with the kid, when the kids are in there and maybe get a little more effective utilization of those spaces. So when we look at how a building is being utilized, we take into consideration a lot of factors. Um, we, we look at the four basic food groups, I guess, if you will. You've got your math, your science, your ELA, uh, and your social studies. But we also take a look at all those other programs that a campus might support. Everything from electives and, and extracurricular through the various specials and pullouts. 
You know, back when I was in school, um, if you were struggling, if you're a little bit behind, you got sent to the resource room. And the resource room was maybe one or more teachers and aides that were scatter, scattered around, maybe even some student tutors that worked with students that were struggling to try to get them back on mainstream. Well, when schools were built in the 50s, 60s, 70s, even 80s, we weren't thinking about diagnostics and speech therapy and reading recovery and math recovery and content mastery. And those of you guys that have lived the, I was going to say nightmare, but lived, lived the dream, you know, from tax recovery, now it's star recovery, and next time it'll be whatever other great idea that the state legislature comes up with. But to help those kids stay on mainstream and give them the best opportunity you can for success, we create little pockets within the campuses to support those programs. What that does, though, is it goes out and it captures instructional space. You know, today when we plan for educational facilities, we don't call them necessarily special ed, but we identify specific spaces within a building, and they're typically 400 square feet, give or take, where you can have focused instruction with one, two, three, a half a dozen students to help them with a spe specific topic or instructional challenge that they're faced with to help them get back on, on track. But in some of the older buildings, and yours aren't completely old, but they are old, obviously they've got some years on them, you're capturing classrooms, full-size classrooms that otherwise might support up to 22 or 25 students. Uh, so we go through a, a, really a gamut of things when we analyze facility and how it's being utilized. And for those of you that, that don't know, the state dictates that for pre-K through fourth grade, you're limited to 22 students per classroom. Above that, we use the number of 25. Uh, having raised four kids, I can tell you, you get into middle school, you pack it with more than 25 kids, you're just asking for trouble. So we see 25 is kind of a good management number uh, in terms of looking at capacity within a campus. The other thing that's, that's big in our analysis, I mentioned earlier that we benchmark the school with what the state says it should be. Years ago, 30 years ago when we started doing this, the TEA had guidelines for what a school should be in the state of Texas. Over the last few legislative sessions, that's evolved into the administrative code, so now it's law. Chapter 19, or Title 19, uh, Chapter 61 of the, the Texas Administrative Code now dictates what an educational facility should be in the state of Texas. And that includes new design as well as renovation. If you go into a facility and you largely affect how those spaces are being utilized, you start moving walls, then the architect has to certify that that building is in compliance with the administrative code. So we have to be mindful of that. And when we looked at your facilities, we went through and measured every classroom to see where we might have some challenges in terms of spaces. And some of you, I'm sure, are in some of those spaces. Maybe you're over in Patterson and you're blessed to have one of those monster classrooms that was blown out at one point, but maybe you're over at Delaney where you're in a you know 620 square foot classroom and you've got 22 little angels making you crazy every day because with all the manipulatives and stations and everything else, it's just super crowded. So we look at all of that. It's not just sticks and bricks. We look at how the building lives and breathes and what those capacities are within your campuses. What we found was and if you're at Delaney, you know this, you guys are busting at the seams over there. Um, when we make our way down through the district, through Patterson, Arthur, the junior high and the high school, what we found was is there's still some room to breathe in those campuses. Now, believe me, I know, you can, you can be three students away from busting your 22 to one and now you've gotta have another section of second grade. Okay, that requires another classroom. Well, if you're limited on classroom because you've dedicated spaces to maybe some of those special instructional units, then we've got some challenges to deal with. What we look for, and this is sort of a, it's, it's part art, part science. When we see numbers around 90% capacity at, a, at the elementary level, that sets off an alarm for us because we know at that point you're probably very close to having to ask for a waiver 
with the state to pack 24 kids in a classroom that really should only have 22. Uh, we also know that if that you start hitting those challenges, it's at least two years. If you say, let's go today and let's get another elementary campus under us, it's two years before those doors would open at a minimum. So when we see a growing district and we see 90%, the bell goes off and we start looking at options. Secondary is a bit different because the student population is more transient, if you will. I mean, you have, it's different because you have electives now. So you may have, you have 26 kids in geometry, but you've got 14 in Spanish too. So it doesn't always work exactly 22 to one, 25 to one. So we start looking at numbers in the 67 to 72% range utilization. Once we start seeing those numbers, the same kind of bell goes off when we think, all right, we're gonna have to start looking at some options here for the future. So I share those kind of, uh, artful scientific numbers that we use because we've sort of applied that here to see where we've got some room to breathe and where we have challenges. The other key component of this, and it's, it was really the catalyst, and I think Mr. G might have covered this a little bit at the last meeting. The other thing that, that really was the impetus behind us launching into this analysis was the sta state mandate for full-time kindergarten. That changes completely how Delaney gets utilized if we keep pre-K there. Now what you're, you're managing comfortably or semi-comfortably with, I think, three, four classrooms, now you're looking at maybe having to have six classrooms to support those pre-K kids, which means you've got a serious challenge at, at, at Delaney. The other thing, and this always gets communities excited, and I, I told Mr. G, I said, just, just breathe in through your nose and breathe out through your mouth. I know they're saying they're building houses and townhomes and everything else, but that doesn't always equate to a bunch of kids in the district. So let's give that some time and see what happens. But in the meantime, let's address this pre-K challenge, but at the same time, put you in a posture to deal with growth when and if you might see it. Um, as an example, and, and I think the UT Arlington study might have, might have uh, shed some light on this. Uh, back in 1997, when I did the master plan for Hearst Euless Bedford, the demographer at that time said, HEB is a sleeping giant. And, and my thoughts were, what are you talking about? They, they, at that time, I think they had 19,000 kids in the district, but what they also had was an inordinate amount of retired seasoned citizens in the community. And as those people transitioned out of the community for whatever reason, now we had starter homes for younger couples. Big trees, big yards, great schools, and that's exactly what happened. Now they've got 20-something thousand students. I mean, Kennedale is, is prime for that type of transition over time. So we want to make sure we don't build you into a corner or make a facility decision that handicaps you if you have to respond to something like that, and some type of demographic change like that in your district. And the new developments that are coming in at least has set, set off an alarm for folks to start looking at that. So this is kind of where you're at right now, recognizing that we have the pre-K challenge. And from that, we sort of began to look at options because if we're, if we're sitting at 55% at Arthur or 66% at Patterson, we've got some room to breathe there. And at 53% at the junior high, again, a little bit different, transient population, it's only holding seventh and eighth grade right now. So what would changes mean district-wide? So we begin to look at how your grade tiers are set up within the community. And we came up through our analysis with some objectives. If we're gonna go into this, what are we trying to accomplish, okay? First thing obviously is, is how do we address the full day, full day uh, pre-K program? can't happen at Delaney under the current setting. So we're gonna have to look at making room at Delaney. So let's put that as check number one. We've gotta address that. We also wanna minimize how many times kids move around the district. Um, a lot of districts go through a, a different scenarios. We've worked with, we've worked with districts that have one grade, one, one campus per grade level. And so they now have seven 
campuses to serve pre-K through fifth grade. And they're all at capacity. So what do you do? Do you build seven new campuses to help with that growth, which is financially not, not feasible? Or do you look at changing your grade tier structure? The other thing that comes out of that is, and teachers, you know this, the longer you can keep a kid at a campus, particularly when they're in their developmental years, they become secure. They become comfortable in that environment. They see the same faces every year. They see their friends every year. And the staff see the kids every year. And they get to watch them grow. And it becomes a, a comfort zone. It becomes a comfort level. It becomes their home away from home as they're learning. Uh, and it also helps teachers from a vertical alignment perspective to say, hey, you know, little Johnny, he may be a troublemaker, but he's a smart kid. He needs help here. When he gets to third grade, you know, we're, we're prepping him as best we can. You don't end up with the, your third grade teachers going, you know, we're testing for reading now, and you guys over at that campus aren't teaching our kids how to read. It helps you guys work together as a unit. And so by keeping those kids on a campus as long as we can, particularly during their formative years, is an advantage. So we want to minimize the moves. We also want to be, I think, respectful, and, and maybe we're overthinking this, but I think what you guys have developed over the years in Kennedale is a bit of a culture, a bit of a history. Between Delaney and Patterson, you've got defined attendance zones. You've got two distinct campuses that generally serve the, the same grade levels. We start mixing that up. I don't know if it would create turmoil in the district, but we want to be mindful of that history, be respectful of that, and keep it on our radar when we make any of our decisions. We also want to be as efficient as we can so you don't end up with a 90 plus percent utilization at Delaney and a 53 percent utilization at the junior high. So we want to be as efficient as we can with our campuses to give us room to grow so you're not looking at a large capital expense perhaps to build another campus until and when it's actually needed. And then finally, with the news of the development, and there's been a lot of presentations at City Council and a lot of maps shown of townhouses and things like that. Again, not sure exactly what that's going, what the impact is going to be a year or two from now in Kennedale, but we want to put you guys in the best posture we can to give you some room to breathe at your campuses to absorb whatever growth might affect the respective attendance zones. Uh, I can tell you, you know, some developments we've seen. We've worked in some of the fastest growing districts in the state. Um, they, they come in with these beautiful neighborhoods and they're great little starter homes, but you, all you see are little tykes playgrounds in the yard. You don't see kids yet because they're two or three years away from actually starting school. So you don't want to overreact, but we want to be prepared for that potential growth. So we came up with a number of options and it obviously wasn't included in our formatting, but that's okay, you get the gist of it. The first option, and I think it, it developed out of some conversations with uh, the superintendent, administration, school board members of, we've got a challenge with pre-K, and for those of you that don't know, the pre-K was housed in the, in the building that is sort of the administrative complex. That wing had horrible roofing issues, still does. Um, had to move those babies out, and they said, let's take them over to Delaney. Delaney took them, and now they're busting, you know, popping at the gills. But let's look at a new pre-K center, one that focuses on pre-K and see how that impacts our, our, our district. Well, in doing so, we looked at taking Patterson and making it a K-1 campus. We looked at making Delaney a 2-3 campus. And then we looked at making Arthur a 4 and 5th grade campus. Now, in all of these scenarios I'm going to show you tonight, and take a deep breath, it's based on the premise that 6th grade goes to the middle school, junior high, and you actually create a 6-8 campus, as it, I think, should be instructionally, okay? We'll get into those details uh, at another time, but suffice it to say, we have spent hours on campus and hours with the principal and staff. We think we've got some really good ideas. Uh, it accomplishes a lot in terms of getting band over there where it belongs, sixth grade open for pre-athletic. There's a lot of academic uh, benefits to that, so we're gonna continue to explore that, but. All of these options are based on sixth going to uh, the junior high. So there's some pluses and minuses to this. Um, the, obviously the new pre-K center solves your full day pre-K. You've got a dedicated facility that serves 
uh, the students for your, for your pre-K program. I'm not sure again what happened here with the formatting, but uh, let me see if I can change something real quick here. Move this. Let's remove it. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Now nah, we're not good. Okay. Well, they're shown here. A little bit of room here. Yeah. All right, let's give it a go. I thought you changed it. There we go. All right. This is going to take all the fun out of this if it doesn't work. Okay. this before. There. Okay. That's why they do what they do. So pluses and minuses to this. First off, uh, it does address the pre-K issues. Secondly, it does give you guys some certainly room for growth uh, district-wide at your pre-K through fifth grade levels. The challenge with this is, um, you know, your kids are going to change basically every two years. Um, and that's probably not something that, it is not something that's favorable for your early grade levels. Uh, it also breaks up the history that you guys have with two distinct elementary type campuses in the district. The students would, though, touch every building in the district as they went through their, their various grade levels. But I'm not sure that's, that may be a badge of honor, it might be a scar of war, I don't know. But I, we tend to not look at that as a, as a, as a good plan. Uh, but it's a horribly inefficient use of your facilities. Even though you get a new standalone pre-K campus, you've got almost 40 classrooms at the elementary level that aren't being utilized. That's not efficient. And it does give you room for growth, but I think there's better ways to utilize it. And so the thought of a new campus, while I think it was a nice shiny object, I think long term uh, is not the best alternative with your existing structures. Plus, you're talking about a $4 million price tag for this facility, and that doesn't include dining services and food services for those students. So you have to have it contiguous with one or more of your camp, one of your campuses so that the kids could have some way to have dining services. So with that as our first step, we went to option two. Now option two, just sort of stretched things out. Patterson's got the great big classrooms. So we looked at dedicating pre-K to Patterson, and that's just going to be on the internet, I think. Delete it now. I know. <laughs> pre-K through one would be served by Patterson, okay? Second and fourth, again, at Delaney, and fifth and sixth at Arthur. Again, very similar to the first one. It does address your pre-K problem. Um, but again, your students are moving. We busted the Delaney history and, and Patterson's history. Not very efficient with the utilizations. Um, and we, oh, I'm sorry, Arthur, yeah, just fifth grade with, with Arthur. We certainly got room for growth, but again, very, very poor utilization of those three campuses. So we moved the grades around a little bit more. We went to option three. Option three, very similar to the all three of us, we're slowly kind of playing with options here. 
Patterson becomes a pre-K-1 campus, Delaney a second, third, and Arthur a fourth and fifth. Little better efficiency in terms of utilization of facilities gives you room for growth. We've addressed the pre-K challenge, uh, but students are still going to go through every building in the district. They're going to be changing every couple of years when they really should be staying as much as they can in a hard campus. And again, the, the, the Laney patterson history of two elementary campuses sort of gets thrown out. So then I came up with the genius option, which actually got shot down quickly because it completely threw uh, the district into, we blew the Delaney Patterson history, and now, uh-oh, we've got to come up with a third attendance zone in the district. Where are we going to draw those lines, smart guy? So I wasn't necessarily prepared to do that, but I wanted to show you guys this because the capacities within your building gives you the opportunity to go to three pre-K-5 campuses. And you would have pre-K at each one of the neighborhood, if you can call it, campuses. Uh, but your campuses are not that far apart. You've got some challenges there. I think you're still going to end up east, west, north, south, haves, have-nots, I don't know, whatever you want to call it. I think this creates a lot of turmoil. We're making a problem that we don't need to make to solve a problem that's easy solvable, easily solvable in another way. But this does... Uh, check at least three of the boxes and and if you're really interested in keeping those kids at that home campus as many times as you can or as many years as you can it's a great solution but again it sort of creates a problem that we you know how sometimes the government makes a problem trying to solve another problem I, I kind of, this kind of falls in that category so then we ended up with option five um, which was again a the result of a lot of cussing and discussing and chewing on the other options. Basically, we looked at Arthur in a different light. It also has large classrooms. It's also laid out fa fairly well. So we looked at making Arthur a pre-K through first campus. The classrooms are large. That's the other, I didn't just uh, touch on this component earlier, but for pre-K through first grade, your classroom should be 800 square feet to the administrative code. You've got, with the exception of a few classrooms at, at uh, Delaney right now, you don't have those early age kids in large classrooms. And it's easy for me to go into a pre-K or kinder or first grade classroom and say, you know what, if you had a garage sale, you'd have more room. But I know how teachers love their manipulatives. They, they use them, they save them, and they keep them for years. So that's why, because there is so much hands-on instruction at that grade level, that those classrooms are intended to be as large as the state says they should be. We can accomplish that uh, by moving pre-K and first to Arthur. Then you've got second through fifth. Again, your testing years at Delaney and Patterson. So we've maintained... Um, big chunk of that history of two elementary campuses, same attendance zones uh, throughout the district, you still have 16 unused classrooms at Delaney, 12 unused classrooms at Patterson, and four unused classrooms uh, at Arthur. And so it gives you a lot of room to grow district-wide. Um, it also addresses, you'll, and I didn't touch on this early through the charts, but what we tried to do when we were identifying your core classrooms is making sure we also dedicate an, effect, uh, an appropriate number of spaces at least consistent with what you have now in terms of your special ed and full on classes. So whether it's GT or reading recovery, we've got those spaces dedicated throughout the district. So that was option five. Um, so you can see how we sort of went through the evolution of breaking it down by grade tier, but not just doing it strictly from a perspective of we need a place to put bodies. How does it, how does it affect, affect the tradition of, of Kennedale? How does it affect the efficiency of how the building's being utilized? How does it affect vertical alignment and ownership in campuses, not just for the teachers, but also the kids as they're in those campuses? And those were sort of our guiding posts as we went through the analysis. It wasn't just about, hey, we've got more room, let's stick kids over here. So moving forward, we still have some things to do. Um, we want to go back and have additional meetings with campus leadership because 
the end users always see the, some of the minefields that we didn't see. And so we want to share with them in great detail how we've actually mapped out their campuses to see how we think it would work outside looking in. Not that they haven't been part of the, the dialogue already, but uh, you can't ever get too much information from the end users of the facility. We also want to talk to staff, talk to some of the teachers. Um, teachers are creatures of habit, and sometimes it's, it's hard for them to see the potential of a change because they're so handicapped in some cases, maybe by what they are experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis with their spaces. I don't mean that in a bad way, but we, over the years, I've had conversations with teachers of, well, what if we did this? We can't do that because the bathroom's way down there. I know, but if we moved you over there, you'd be close to the bathroom. Well, yeah, but that's never going to happen. They're just, they're just so used to it, it's hard for them to see the, the forest to the, the trees sometimes. With all of these options, um, there are some capital improvements that will need to be made. Uh, it may be upgrading some restrooms. It might be moving some wall, opening up some classrooms to make some larger spaces. Um, it might be a matter of closing off some spaces and making them smaller so we create more special ed classrooms. Um, but they're modest improvements, uh, not major wholesale uh, capital improvements that, that will be required. As we filtered through those options, uh, I mentioned earlier the things that we're talking about at the junior high, we want to come back to you guys and get your feedback on it. This is something we're not talking about having ready for August. This, these are changes we're, we're, we're talking about next year, so we can't cuss and discuss this too many times. I think it's important to the community. Uh, it's important to the taxpayers, and it's important to the kids. They're, they're instructional environment. And so we're going to bring all this data back to you again. Eventually, we want to compile our data, compile our findings, and compile our recommendations so that we can take them to the school board and they ultimately can make a decision and give the superintendent and administration some direction on which way to go. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions or take any darn. back and touch back on the, the meeting, the last meeting we had. <clears throat> so if you weren't at that meeting, a lot of you were, but some of you weren't, the, in the next three months, 12, 24 months, we're going to have anywhere from 13 to 14 housing developments that are going to be coming into play in our district. Okay. With an estimated, I think it's 1,170 housing units, I think is what it said on the last uh, presentation that we did. If you did an average of 10% of students, that's going to be probably about 110 to 120 students. If you mark it 15%, then now you're up to 150, 170 students. So we're going to have growth. And if you, on the slide that he showed where it showed our, our the printing down, you can see the high school numbers have stayed pretty steady all the way across. Our lower grade levels have gotten smaller on the campuses, particularly at, at Arthur. Okay, Arthur will probably have the lowest number of students that they've had in a very long time next year, okay? If you saw the presentation from before, we have some bubbles, you know, and we had a, a decline in our younger uh, population. If you look at that uh, population tree that I think I showed on the last one, there's an anomaly, and that anomaly is hitting us in the lower grade levels. But the UTA study, especially the housing developments, is predicting that that anomaly is going to go away very soon, and our growth is going to be in our lower grade levels. Our capacity is what we're con concerned with, okay? So that is our big con concern. How are we going to house the growth and the potential growth in the, the developments that we're anticipating? Um, so we've looked at a lot of different options. We've done a lot of different studies. This was informational, as I said, to sit there and try to, you know, get, get the last one was to kind of give you the 50,000 foot view. This was to bring it down and say, hey, these are the considerations what we're looking at. The next meeting will be on the 22nd of June, and there we're going to dig into these options a little bit more and kind of have some discussions that go on about these options and see which one we feel like is going to be the best option to take back to the board. So you kind of understand where we're, we're headed with all of this. And we've asked that, you know, our community, we've got a lot of uh, staff here, but, you know, they're, they're very interested in what's going on. We want our community to sit there who, you know, are going to have the kids in the, in the district to have a lot of input in what's going on with so I, could, I kind of summarized what we did last time, touched on this. So what questions, concerns, you want to 
No. No, I'll tell you. Um, So we are, I am, I won't, I won't corner these two guys or put them under any pressure or, or Dr. Boo or anybody hiding back up there. No, um, we are, I am 98.73% confident we can move six right over there with no problem. Okay. Um, where I see challenges is instructionally and how spaces are designed for instruction, specifically at the science level. Not that the labs don't work, but they don't meet the current code. I say code, they don't meet the 2004 beyond code for what a science lab should be, specifically with some of your plumbing, mechanic, mostly mechanical and how those places, those spaces are ventilated. So what I, and I, again, this is 30,000 feet and I'm just, nothing's etched in stone, but you have a great opportunity to come off both of those corridors and create a, a connecting wing, if not a single, maybe two-story wing, with age of grade appropriate uh, science lab, size appropriate science lab, create a science wing, perhaps incorporate some of the other great programs that are going on at the, the junior high, robotics, uh, there's, there's uh, computer classroom, there's several programs particularly related. We didn't get into House Bill 5, I don't know if you talked about it last time, but you know, for those of you who know, four by four, the legislature got smart, finally realized not every kid's going to college. They got rid of four by four, but they brought in House Bill 5, gave you guys all kinds of opportunities to give kids alternate, in, in alternate, alternate endorsements, and now that's migrating down to the junior high level. So a new instructional wing opens up more spaces as you grow. But as it sits right now, we feel confident that we can fit those kids in there, still serve choir, still serve band, still serve theater, still feed them, still have the restrooms, make it work, do special ed. We're looking at some tweaks maybe to uh, the building, the old, I guess it was an old ag structure out there, uh, converting yeah, that to IT building. The IT building yeah. now, uh, converting that to some instructional spaces to give you some room in the short term. Uh, and, if, and if it really gets ugly, You've still got some, I know you might have just driven around and kind of grimaced, but you've still got some very functional portable buildings out there that could be utilized if you needed them. But just within the, the bricks and mortar you have right now, it looks like we can put those kids in there. So I, I say that, say we're not afraid of growth because you, like you say, you got land. I mean, there's land there. Great opportunity for growth. Absolutely. We would actually, there are some projects we might sneak in this summer, but the bulk of it will be done next summer. You know, some of that depends on how soon yeah. we can get the group to sit there and come to a consensus to make a recommendation to the board, because if some of that, that could start taking place next school year. Well, that actually included your concerns. Like, say, if our survey comes to pre K through first, mm -hmm. I would. I think we never, we never try to be a part of a strategy that intentionally move, moves kids over Christmas break. For one, it's a parent pick up and drop, drop off nightmare to try to get that figured out, you know, because nobody's thinking about that over the holiday break. But at the same time, it's kind of tough on the kids because you're coming back and not too long after that, there's some testing going on. So you want to be mindful of that. Uh, but as Mr. G said, if we can get the ball rolling, there are some interim things we can do for spaces and really begin to get down in the weeds in terms of classroom assignments and that kind of thing so that our planning over that summer of 2022 is not as painful uh, as it is if we try to cram it all together. But the things that we're talking about doing, it's mostly either add a wall here, take a wall down, maybe add a door, do some paint. It's not wholesale renovation of these campuses. So it's, it'll be easy to do. Position students in certain areas of the building will be more common. So 
No, 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 no. Okay. Uh, hypothetically, if we remove the straight to the junior high, what would that put back in custody? And the junior high having to pay for the straight? Um, I had my laptop. I'd tell you, but we can, I'll show you that at our next powwow. It's, it's still, okay. there's still plenty of room. I say there's plenty of room. Okay. Every, we've actually planned for, uh, I think right now they have two teams per grade level. So we plan for two teams for sixth grade as well. We've also kept in mind the, um, the recovery classrooms related to uh, reading and math that both grades have right now. We assign that for uh, sixth grade. We also set aside an extra art classroom. We also set aside a science lab for sixth grade. So uh, we've accounted for, I think, all of those spaces to give you guys some room to grow. It's not to say you might not end up, I don't wanna say that, I don't wanna give you a, a negative thought, but I mean, honestly, you've got room to grow. You might maybe end up with 26 kids for a, a year or semester until we can look at additional spaces. But um, it is a, it's, it's been an arduous task. And, and the principal there, is Mr. Ryan's been great to work with. He's, he's taken us to spaces he didn't even know he had in the building. There's a whole dungeon behind those dressing rooms. I don't know if you guys know that, but we've looked at all of it and looked at opportunities, and I think we'll, we'll make it work. Any other questions? Snow, snowstorm, freezing didn't help it with this. I mean, we, we put substantial effort into irrigation. You know, one thing, the water, I mean, was uh, an issue. Um, the water was peeling off a lot of the grass, and then the grass was, or the dirt was compacted. It had been irrigating the field, and, you know, it's slowly getting back to where it needs to be. And we also want to, on that other side, open up that, we moved off the of portables when I first got here to make the space available, one, for our youth league, but also for our junior high to have places to practice up there instead of practicing on the game field. Okay. Anybody else? Sorry, I'm just, a bunch of us that make it to the game need their cupcakes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, no, I, and, and you I know. I that lady. <laughs> <laughs> the, the truth is, I, I, and I hope all your wheels are spinning and you're coming up with good questions and we'll be ready for those at the next meeting, and if you wanted to get them to Mr. G in advance, I'd be happy to be prepared for it. But you guys can't help, some of you I'm sure, you can't, you can't help yourself from maybe getting down into the weeds and thinking about just things just like that. Obviously with any change, structural change in, in the grade tier for grade tiers for Kennedale, there's gonna be some growing pains and like, ooh, we missed that. But we are trying to make sure we've got as many flex spaces at all the campuses to absorb some of those surprises. And then functionally, as those campuses take place, you spend a lot of time in the dressing rooms at the junior high. Sixth graders don't really dress. But they need a place to whatever they do. And we're going to have it for them. You know, they, you've got dressing rooms that aren't really being used right now. They're either storage or an office. So we're, we're looking down at that level.
chapter around Arthur. Arthur, Arthur, Arthur yeah, I know. I, 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 the, the chapter around Arthur is also concerning the talk of uh, ways, you know, looking at ways to bring traffic flow, working with the city to sit there and make things much, much easier. Mm -hmm. but unfortunately, Arthur is landlocked in a small area, so we really don't have any control over it. Mm -hmm. But we do have some ways, we do have a, some available land on the backside to where we can have drop off, pick up, you know, off the backside of the campus, one on one side, and maybe one on the other side to where we can control the flow a little bit better. Which priority do you look at? So, like, this, this splitting off pre K to remain the same lane and then maybe have an additional district pre K with the Patterson that doesn't fall in that space with the UIA? Pre K at Patterson, pre K at the yeah, landing? Splitting off, it's just splitting off and there's a lot of mess crazy in it. I don't know how to do that model. <laughs> what model is. Um, one, we don't have as many pre K as we do the other grade levels. And, and I don't know that that solves space issues the way that the other than the other ones do. I, I think I think that's a sort of a temporary fix. Um, because we haven't really addressed um, the inefficiency of Arthur. Um, and we haven't addressed, you know, this all started as a pre-K analysis uh, and how that affected the district uh, overall. But it evolved and we can't, we don't just look at a specific challenge and try to fix that. We try to look at the downstream effect. And what it allowed us to do was see, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for the students if we move sixth grade to the junior high instructionally and programmatically for extracurricular electives and everything, that's as it should be. And we, and we feel confident that that can work. In doing so, we've even opened up more space between the three campuses. So just shifting pre-K on the surface is a good temporary fix, I think. But long term, it doesn't put the district in a posture to deal with some of these developments that are coming and the potential for your elementaries to be inundated with, with new babies, because that's, that's what happens typically in new development. Unless they're building, you know, $350,000, $400,000 ranchettes out somewhere, you're not, you're not going to get young kids with those families. But these some of these developments that are coming in, you're going to get some younger kids. So that's, that was really kind of one of the things in the back of our mind is, how can we create the most space at Delaney and Patterson, but still address the pre-K issue? <clears throat> in the In the overall analysis of, hey, we got some opportunities at the junior high as well. So in a vacuum, I think that's a, that, that sounded horrible, I'm sorry. In, a, in just a quick shot, that's a great, great opportunity. Let's move kids over to Patterson. But that doesn't serve some of the long, and the worst thing we do is do something in 2022, then come back in 2023, do something different, or 24, people are gonna go, what are you guys doing? So we're just trying to be mindful of all that. And also to speak to what you, brought up and I had a kindergarten teacher here here with me. If we could put pre K in first grade in one campus, the learning environment that we want to create is, is an experiential learning environment where it's all about experiences and learning at an early level. And I'm gonna be brutally honest with you, we're not gonna fix reading levels in high school. And we're not gonna fix it in junior high school. And we're probably not gonna fix it in the fifth grade. But we're going to fix reading levels in our early grade levels, pre-K through first grade. That's where we're going to fix reading levels. And I've got a lot of educators in this room that are shaking their head. And i got a kindergarten teacher who is very much, I think, in favor of having pre-K through first grade all together. That would be an incredible environment for us to have. And if we could do that, I think we're going to be a district that people are going to want to come to. And that was where we originally came up with the pre-K early childhood center, a standalone pre-K. But functionally and looking at the, the math that goes along with that and dollar signs that go along with it and then just the utilization of our other campuses it didn't make sense and that's where we came into well how can we reconfigure what we have more effective and efficiently utilize the spaces that we have more effectively and efficiently and come up with a good plan that we think will really give us a model that's going to set our district apart and help us progress in our future and accomplish the academic
Some musical chairs there. We play musical chairs for one year <coughs> to sit there and accommodate the, uh, the the model that we hope to move to is having them all in one pre-K and first grade and move into another standard. Yeah. Sorry, I don't mean to go over it. Last question. Uh, pre-K used to be qualifications, full qual uh, full qualifications for yes. the qualifications for pre-K. I mean, I know kinder is not first our, and not fifth. And our goal is to sit there and get to where we're letting everybody. As far as the improvements to the campuses, oh yeah, it's there's talking about very little work. As long as we have time to plan for it, there, there's not that much work to be done to the building structures themselves. Uh, I'll give you an example: the apartment complex up by the central office at Hammond Creek. Had it not been for all the rain that they were getting, that's slowing them down. They were predicting that within three months we were already in between. Actually, Arthur is is the one that we're really taking out walls at Arthur, and and imagine if you will, you know what we're talking about. The way we try to lay these classrooms out is to actually have some interaction between the classrooms in such that we maybe have a connecting door between two pre-K classrooms with ribbon windows between them. Because you know how we, the challenge with this um, is you don't have restrooms in every classroom. So those babies need to go to potty. Can you tell our grandkids? Um, somebody's got to take them, either an aide or, or something like that. But if, if they're working as a team, they can see classrooms and, and work together collaboratively. So those are some of the kind of kind of some of the improvements we're talking about doing. Easily done over summer. This may help also. The model that we're looking for with the early childhood center, which would be pre-K through first, it's not your traditional yeah. educational model. It's not them sitting in the same classroom all day long. It's going to be a very open concept where they are moving from experience to experience to experience throughout the day. And then Ms. Keys up there who has been, you know, we have gone to Mansfield's early childhood center. We have gone uh, a few other places what could be in our district as opposed to what it is right now. So I guess that's a big also kind of an aha moment of where we want to go as opposed to what we have right now and the models that we have. I, I, mean, think, I think what she's, I think what Ms. Bell said is it's going to be more of a bridge to bring our Tiger here. I think our, that part of our, the our older part of Arthur where I went to grade school. Right. <laughs> yeah, when we went to grade school. Yeah, it's been there a long time. It's been there a long time. It's right. So I 
I just know that there's that's an old that's an old building they got they some of the stairs coming from you know from the from the hill kitchen and so I was not fully on hand right that it doesn't appear but I'm just wondering if structurally you get in there and there's a lot more that you don't know and the thing is we're not gonna know until we get in there and find out because right now we have issues and we can't get them fixed because we're all we've been working is so you know that gives us this opportunity to just get in and try to fix them but it's only an issue when it rains yes ma'am Or sixth grade, like on one area of the same sign, away. I mean, that's fine. (laughs) Yes. It's kind of like a freshman going into high school. Yes. So, you know what? This is the first thing I said we're going to have to look at. You know what I'm saying? Okay, now see this that that is that no that's that's two two whole meetings is what but honestly o- over the years the good what I get to be is a student of the game. So I, I get to watch from the outside, I look at the data and I don't disagree. I mean, when you can give a four-year-old your iPhone and they hand it back to you and you have apps you didn't even know existed uploaded on your phone, I can't imagine what eighth graders are like. So, well, I guess I can, but but the point is that's exactly what we looked at when we laid the junior high out is how can we keep the sixth graders here for 90% of their day, seventh graders here, eighth graders here. Um, and we were able to do that. and create some core areas for art and science and that type of thing. Obviously in gymnasiums, cafeteria, there might be some crisscross, but for the most part we were able to keep uh, units, grade units within the, the building and keep kids mostly, you know, separate and apart. And they're already used to pods right now, you know, which they've been doing pods, which at the junior high they have teams. Yeah. So it's really kind of the same concept, but they are, you know, they work small area uh, you know, and there's pods right now and the teams they do the same thing the only thing that would be would be the electives where they were utilizing shared spaces but their schedules would not be where they would have been around them yeah. I mean you, you can control that off and, and there's a section of the building that's already got doors and areas for them to be able to just walk on might actually take you guys in, um, in, in a similar setting that you teachers are used to, split you up into groups and let you, as small groups, 
filter through it together and talk about it and then give us some feedback on, on what you see, what you don't. We'll give you some maps, give you some numbers to look at and, um, and, and continue to just dialogue about it. Are you all interested in continuing with the, you know, being part of this group? Thank you all for coming. We appreciate everybody's participation.